Opening your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Thank you guys for singing. I loved it. I loved it. I've got a couple questions I want to ask real quick here. Are there any great grandmas here today? Anybody that's a great grandma? All right. Why don't you have all the great grandmas stand? Okay. Hey, will all the great grandmas stand? Oh, I didn't realize I was talking to myself there for a second. That was kind of weird. All right. Good. That is awesome. A lot of people never got to have a great grandma. This is awesome. Now, any great, great grandmas here today? That is really great. I used to have, when I was three, a great, great grandpa. That's good. Praise the Lord. That's good. Praise the Lord. So we're going to have a little contest here. It's uh, arm wrestling. <laughs> well, maybe not, but anyway. So the other great-great-grandma. Let's have you both stand at the same time. There you go. Great, great. And I want to know something if it's not too... I wouldn't... I'm already going to ask, okay? So how old, how old are you? 86. How old are you, Miss Edna? Did she beat you? 91. Praise the Lord. 86 and 91. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. It's an honor. It's good to get to be 86 and 91. My great-great-grandpa had to get 97. 90, just 94 to become a great-great-grandpa. Yes. happened, but I want to thank God for the life that he has given me, Amen. staying with my children, although Amen. he's taken my two older ones home already, but the life that he's given me with all my kids and my grandchildren, Amen. I thank him for it. I Amen. have nothing to do with it. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's an honor to have you here. All right. Yes, Brother Gary. So let's all be praying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Seriously, let's all be praying. Amen. All right, let's stand together. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 18, verse 24, and jump into this Mother's Day message. Now, I, um, I want to say this. If there's anyone in here that wonders if Bill's song was appropriate, it was. And I could take you to the Word of God and show you that. Um, there's entire psalms about God's creation. Not everything in, in the... I mean, it is, is a beautiful, beautiful song. And I just thank you for singing it. And uh, I, I just... I believe God was honored and glorified by it. And God's heart is, is many things, but one of them, and high up, is the family. And as he was singing that song, and many of us that... Um, Remember when people came to us and said stuff like, you better love them while you can. You know, I know it's probably hard changing all these diapers, or I know it might be expensive, blah, blah, blah. There'll come a day when you'll wish you could change a diaper. There'll come a day when you wish you could watch a kid learn how to walk for the first time. There'll come a day when, and they were right about every single thing they ever told me. So that song brought back tons of memories for everyone. And as old as you are, or as young as you are, that song helped you think about something very important to God, which is your family. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Verse 24, He's now made Eve. He says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And there was your first family. I sometimes hear young couples that after they're married, you overhear people say to them, when do you plan on starting a family? They already started the family. The moment they got married, they started the family. And that's really important that we understand that. Now, if you'll turn back into the New Testament with me to Colossians chapter 3, I want to read a quick little verse here. Colossians chapter 3. This is one of those Bible verses that you could probably memorize in 15, 20 minutes. And spend the rest of your life surrendering to. 
It's a very family Bible verse. It's a very relationship Bible verse. It's a very life Bible verse. You can't live your life without needing this Bible verse. Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask this morning, as we look to your word, that you would move, that the Spirit of God would take the very, very powerful word of God and touch every single heart here. Lord, I pray for those that could possibly be here and they just don't know you as their Savior yet, that today would be the day of their salvation. That believers that we've been here, uh, maybe there are those among us and even ourselves, every person here has other areas of our lives that we still need to surrender to you. Um, God, we pray that you'd bring those to mind today, that relationships would be strengthened, that marriages would be strengthened, that families would be strengthened, that hope would be given and comfort would be given, and you would meet with us today in a real way. God, we pray that you will be honored and glorified by how we respond to your message to us today, and we pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This subject of forgiveness is a subject that every believer needs to hear about. Every lost person needs to hear about, and no family can live without. You can't stay close to mom. You can't stay close to dad. You can't stay close to husband. You can't stay close to wife. You cannot stay close to your parents without forgiveness. Because every single person in this room, at their very best, according to God, all of our righteousnesses are his filthy rags. We can't please him by doing our best. <laughs> and I guarantee you, we're not going to please each other by doing our best. Now, that'd be bad enough, but the honest truth is we don't always do our best. And the, the, the people that we let down our guard the most with are the ones we love the most. So guess what? They end up being the ones we hurt the most. Those of us that are saved, we've been forgiven, and we're going to have to forgive. So when I'm wronged in my relationships, am I quick to forgive? Am I quick to forgive or do I hang on? Do I bring it up over and over again or can I let it go? Am I wanting to forgive and forget? You say, I know you use that word forget with forgiveness and I'm trying. I get it. I get it. But is your goal to forgive and forget? Are you still laying in bed at night? You can't go to bed at night without rehearsing it all and rehearsing it all and rehearsing it all. This is what gets um, what the, the great theologians would call stinking thinking going on, see? Because how many of us ever laid in bed at night? We couldn't sleep because we kept rehearsing it over and over and over and over again. How good God is that he fed me one more day. He clothed me one more day. I had a job to go to one more day. Everything was taken care of one more day. I can't go to sleep. God, help me get to sleep. I can't quit thinking about all the great things you're doing in my life. And then we go to counseling. What's your problem? I just can't sleep. Why not? Because God's so good to me. I just can't get over it. I just rehearse it over and over and over. And every time I try to go to sleep, I just start thinking how good he is. A lot of people have that issue. If there's any counselors here, professional counselors, your line outside your door is extremely short for those people. In fact, the first one may show up soon, but I doubt it. And the chances that you're one of those people are really close to zero. I'm not saying you've never had a night you couldn't sleep because you're so excited. I'd say the first time I emailed Tammy, I didn't get to sleep that night very well. Pretty excited. Guess why? She emailed me back. I was thinking, hey, this is pretty good right here. I don't think I can sleep. And then, you know, even though the probably only had like 15 words, and I'm like, I'm just like a teenager or something, just going over what, what do you think she meant by that? What do you, you know, <laughs> you know, quit emailing me. I'm tired. In North Carolina, it's past midnight. Good night. Oh, I wonder what she meant. I can't sleep. But I mean, the people that can't sleep over the long haul, where there's weeks and months that become years, and 
where the bitterness comes and grows and you can't let go of it and you don't even know if you want to anymore. They're not thinking about good things. They're thinking about bad things. And they're thinking about areas of their life where they have a choice to make. To quit nursing this wrong and quit caring so carefully and giving IVs and making sure that this wrong in my life is well taken care of and well nurtured in my heart and mind so that I, I have this bitterness growing in me. What happens is, is if we don't forgive, this bitterness will take over, and we'll get to this in a little bit. It'll take over to the point where it takes on a life of its own. It literally has a life of its own. It has a certain measure of attention that I can be sure I can get through this bitterness and anger. I'm positive I've tried it on 100 people, and 100 people gave me attention. And if I were to let go of it, well, it's become my new identity, this bitter person. I know people don't like to hear that. Because it kind of makes you in charge of yourself, responsible for yourself. People don't want that. It's their fault I feel this way. It's their fault this happened. And it might be their fault it happened, but it's not their fault you feel this way. And we have a choice to make. To nurture and nurse unforgiveness and bitterness or to let go of it and allow forgiveness. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Say, is this a Mother's Day message? Well, it's Mother's Day. Come on. You guys forget what day it was? I don't think that in a family there's a more important subject that we could talk about than forgiveness. Husbands are going to have to forgive wives. Wives, husbands, and I already said all that. It's super important. Hebrews 12, verse 15. The Bible says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Where do roots of bitterness come from? Unforgiveness. And thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator. Now, this is very interesting. Fornicator. Lest there be, sorry, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Now, Esau, you, if you study him, you're probably not going to find any spot where he necessarily committed fornication like we think about it. But here's what he did. Who for one morsel of bread or of meat sold his birthright? Esau, in line with Abraham, sold his birthright. And for what? Because he came back tired and hungry. And he wanted something. He wanted immediate gratification. He, wants in, he wanted instant gratification. He didn't have something in his life at that moment that he, by the way, he did have someone in his life that moment, God, and he did have something in his life that moment, the blessing of God, that mattered for time and eternity. But he also had something in his life that moment that would go away in a moment. If he just waited a moment, if he just endured hunger, a, a, a momentary physical desire, if he'd just gone through a difficult time in his life instead of running away from it, he would have got through it. But instead, he trades something that's temporal and eternal for something that's just temporal and immediate gratification. And that immediate gratification stuff will get us in a lot of trouble. It'll get us in a lot of trouble. Did he get lunch? Yep. Was he promised lunch? Yep. So did, did everybody understand the, the full price of what it was really going to cost for lunch that day? Nope. Nope. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying the devil's a liar. But to do it, he kind of tells a little bit of truth. But anything short of the whole truth is a lie. I'm mad right now. I'm going to get even. This is how I'm going to get even. The devil says, I got a good suggestion for you. Here's how you could do it. Here's what I'll give you right now. Right now. Right now. Boom. You're going to give me that right now? Yeah. 
What's it going to cost me? Oh, it'll hurt your relationship a little bit. Probably not. Probably hurt it a lot. A whole, whole lot. We have to deal with this stuff. Guys, I think guys, at least in the past, guys were more attacked in the area of immediate gratification. In other words, I'll just be, I'll just, you know, quit making you guess. Um, when my grandpa was in 20, I suppose, he could go get pictures of ladies without clothes on. He had to face a woman to do it, though. And if he lived in most of America back then, he had to face a woman he knew to do it. Had to walk up to a counter, look somebody he knew in the eye, and ask for a magazine that everyone knew that no one should look at. That's what he had to do. But today, a person can literally, I could go to my own email right now, and I'm just not 100% sure about this, but many times if I were to look in my junk mail, there's some really pretty bunch of Russian girls that all I got to do is click there to see them, and then if I were to click there, I don't know what happens because I haven't clicked there. It's, it's coming for me. I don't know if you click there, if, if you act, what, what happens next, because I just never have, thankfully. But it's coming after me. It's coming after the pastor of your church. It's God's church. I understand. He's the chief shepherd. I'm, not trying, I'm just saying it's coming after every one of us. Hard. And it's sort of telling the truth, maybe. I don't know, but if it, if it is telling the truth, if you click there, you would see these Russian girls. And if it's really telling the truth, you could, like, I don't know, that it makes it sound like you could bring them over to the stage to marry them, or I don't know what they're getting at. Is that true? Maybe. What would it cost you? I don't know. But the price would be high. And the hurt would be deep. And the only remedy would be forgiveness. Now, today we live in a new day where it's hard for me to exaggerate how much it's changed. But about 35 years ago, there's really good odds. You didn't know a single woman, not one woman, who looked her family in the eye and said, I'm out of here. I'm even leaving the baby. I'm going to go live my life own life you probably didn't know one single person and now 35 years later I doubt there's anybody in this room 25 or older who doesn't know someone by name who did that who walked away from their husband yeah that used to happen some but their kids that never happened sometimes little children and occasionally even a baby what's changed What's changed is the amount of attack we're under today. The access of that attack. It comes at you, it comes to you, it comes for you. Now, everybody in this room, I doubt there's very many people in this room that haven't been attacked. I bet there's not very many people in this room that haven't been um, exploited to some degree with it. And that hurts you, and it hurts people around you. How are we going to go on? If you, if you walk into the living room or wherever your computer is and somebody's seeing something they shouldn't see, they cannot undo that. They can't undo it. They can't unsee it. So they're just going to need love and helped, forgiven. Hopefully they have a repentant heart over it. But they need loved and helped and forgiven. And we need to do that. And if it's us that's, that's done this, then we need loved and helped and forgiven. And if it's us that have come upon this, then we need to give love, help, and forgiveness. Because we're dealing with a new day here, guys. We're not going to get through this without a heavy, heavy, heavy attack. Of all people on earth, those that have been forgiven need to be able to be forgivers. One of the strangest things I've ever seen in my life is the we're, it, this part's not strange. Paul says, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. The Bible says that. And then Paul talks about those that have, that, have been, that have been forgiven so much, being able to extend that kind of forgiveness to others. 
And yet what I've seen over the years, I've actually witnessed people that are really, really struggling with deep, deep sin being forgiven over and over and over and over and over again, and yet so incredibly critical of everyone around them at the same time. That makes no sense. Because of all people, believers that have been forgiven need to be forgivers. And we've all been forgiven of sin that was so heinous it put Jesus on the cross. Now I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I wanted to take you to Matthew, but we are so uh, quickly running out of time. Ephesians chapter 4, and I'll tell you about Matthew. In Matthew 18, Jesus gives this story of a man who owed so much, he could never pay it back no matter what he did in the rest of his life. And the person he owed had actually forgotten about it. And people came to the person he owed and showed him. And so the person he owed brought him before him and was going to put him in debtor's prison. He was going to sell his wife. The person that he owed, the king, was going to sell the man's wife and kids to help pay the debt and put him in debtor's prison. But the man that owed fell on his face before the king and begged for forgiveness, begged him, told him he'd pay it back, although the king had to be saying, you can't, it's impossible. But I see how sincere you are. So he says, I just forgive you. Here's how much you owe me now. Nothing. And that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is, this person did this against me. I quantify it as this big of a debt. And now I say, forgiven. No debt. You don't owe me. I forgive you. I'll try to forget. My commitment is I won't dwell on it. And as time goes by, maybe I won't even think about it much anymore. Maybe I won't even have to push it out of my mind much anymore. And that's true. That's what will happen. Well, now this man that's been forgiven a debt so big you could never repay it, no matter if you, if you gave every penny away you made your whole life, you could have never repaid this debt. This guy finds out that somebody owes him about two days' wages. In fact, one to two days' wages, depending on how much it made. And he says, bring him to me. And he won't forgive this man that only owes him about two days' wages when the king forgave him of a debt that you could never repay in your lifetime. And he puts this man in debtor's prison. Do you know it's pretty hard to make money in prison? Pay off a debt. The king finds out about it and is very wroth, very angry, very mad about it. This is not right. You were forgiven a debt you could have never pay, repaid, but yet you can't forgive these little things that happen. And the story is not about them. The story is about us. The story is about us. The story is about believers that have been forgiven need to be forgivers. It's about there's no way you're going to get through this life of yours without people doing you wrong. But your wrong put me on the cross. Jesus speaking, your wrong put Jesus on the cross. And he says, I forgive you. In fact, I come to you with open arms. I'll kneel down however tall you are when you get here. I'll be eye level with you. I love you. And we say, get away from me. You did this to me. Get away from me. You did that to me. I can. And God says, that's not right. You cannot have the home God wants you to have without forgiveness. You can't have the workplace God wants you to have without forgiveness. You can't have the church God wants you to have without forgiveness. You can't have life the way God wants you to have it without forgiveness. Now, real quickly, Ephesians 4, verse 31. Here's what happens when we don't forgive. Let all bitterness... And bitterness is like a poison. Bitterness is like gall. It's like a poison that goes through the body, goes through the mind. You could look at a bitter person at first. They've, they've not forgiven. They're allowing things to start to build up in their heart and mind. It's flowing in them. Maybe nobody around them can see it, but they know that inside, they're just, they've just about had it. They're starting to get bitter. But they can still control it. How's it going? Great. How's it going for you? It's amazing. We're all great. Super. Special. Bitterness. Then it goes on. And wrath. Wrath is where unforgiveness leads to bitterness. Bitterness, if it's not dealt with, 
You've got to go back to forgiveness to deal with it because when you, when you forgive, the whole thing falls apart. Boom, there's just nothing there anymore. So without forgiveness comes bitterness. Then it starts to become smoldering within the person that won't forgive. And as this thing smolders, it's like the best way I've ever been able to describe it. So if you've been, if you've been here for the whole time I've been here, you've heard this several times. But if you take a wood stove, and that's how I grew up, that's how we heated the house. We, took, we, we went out and got wood in the woods, <laughs> and we brought it to our house, and we heated our house with wood heat. And here's what you can do. You can, you can throw a bunch of wood in there right before you go to bed, and better make sure it actually catches on fire, though. Uh, I mean, in other words, you could, you could actually put a fire out by putting wood on it and not making sure that it gets enough air to, it's okay. Now you got some little burning going on, five, six, seven, eight minutes. Shut it down. But now what you've got is all this fuel, all this wrath. It's in there. No one's seen it yet. The bitterness, the poison that's flowing through me from unforgiveness. Nobody, nobody really knows it but me, but it's in there. And all of a sudden you open the stove door, the wood stove, some oxygen goes in and poof, I literally, poof, a bunch of fire and smoke comes out this far out of your stove, your wood stove. Poof, singes your eyebrows, eyelashes. Sometimes it's nice, nose hairs. <laughs> saves money and time. But anyway, boom. Then what happens? Anger. People know now. Okay, couldn't hide it. Boom. I had my explosion. People, uh, you know, they, they didn't know that this was happening in me, and it got worse, and then boom, the anger happened, the explosion happened, and now i got to fix it. Here's how I'm going to fix it. I'm going to explain to everyone around me how bad I was mistreated by someone or several people, which justifies my bitterness and anger and wrath and behavior. Now we're in trouble. We're in bad trouble. It's really hard to turn around here. Next thing that happens, no one's going to buy your story. Because guess what? Someone might have done you wrong. But you chose to have your feelings about it. Your, you chose not to forgive, which has multiplied this thing into the giant problem it is. The problem's not the problem, and what you're going to find out in life is, second message I ever preached here, first Wednesday night, I guess, so third message is, the problem's never the problem. The solution's always the problem. Everybody has about the same problems. But how you go about solving that problem, whether you turn to God for the solution or yourself, that'll determine the outcome. We all have many Almost all about the same problems. So we can start clamor. I got to talk. I got to explain. I got to, you know, justify my bitterness, my anger, my wrath. And then that doesn't work. So evil speaking. Now I'm going to get real specific with people about my situation. It doesn't. Look, if your situation's wrong, it's wrong. No one's saying it didn't. Unforgiveness, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, Sin. You can have a wrong situation. You can be, in the previous verses, it said, be angry and sin not. You can be angry without sinning. And then, evil speaking, and then it says, be put away from you with all malice. Finally, we just get to the point where we think that they're controlling our life, and we're mad about it. You know what would help? It is if, God, you know what you should do to fix this? You should get them. You should get them. Yeah, they drive to work about 40 miles every day. I mean, that's a lot of opportunity for you. We live in Utah. I mean, people are crazy. Hey, put the idea in their head to use their blinker so when the guy behind them goes to cut them off, they have an accident. You know how people are around here? Put your blinker on. Oh, they're wanting to turn. I'll make sure they can't. I don't know. <laughs> what is wrong with us? They're not getting ahead of me. Okay. Maybe you can both just go off the road at the same time together then. Um, so the next verse, what am I supposed to do? Verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, 
forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. How valuable is peace and joy? How valuable is your marriage? How valuable is your heritage? How valuable is it worth trading for a piece of bread and a little bowl of soup? Because I promise you, the devil's got a piece of bread and a little bowl of soup for you, and he'll really give it to you. That part's true. But the actual overall cost for that thing is astronomical, and it's not worth it. So we just need to repent. Admit God's right. Um, confess it to him. Ask him to give you his strength to forgive. Ask him to give you a renewal in that relationship because he can and he wants to. If it's a marriage, I promise you he wants to. Okay? If it's with your children, I promise you he wants to. I could give you God's word on it. So you start praying for stuff that you absolutely know is God's word and God's will, which is in God's word, then you can pray in faith. Now let's turn back and we'll be done. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Jesus came to me while I was a sinner. While I was sinning again, while I was messed up, he didn't say, I'm waiting for you to clean up a bit so that he just came to me all messed up and forgave me and put me on a solid rock. He took me out of the miry clay and put me on a solid rock of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be willing to do for our husband, for our wife, for our children, for our moms, for our dads, for our other fellow church members, for people that God put us in these special relationships. You just can't keep them. Where there's movement, there's friction. Yeah, you can, there's places where there's no movement, there's no friction. Hopefully your family's going somewhere. If your family's going somewhere, it's moving. If it's moving, there's friction. If there's friction, there's going to have to be some fixing. Because friction's going to rub you the wrong way now and then. We're going to have to take time to slow down, like his song said. And remember that little guy that's now 15. Used to be a little guy hanging onto your finger. Look up to you like you were the king of the universe. You never could imagine there'd be a day he might look at you like he can't stand you. But it'll probably come. Really? You know, it's okay. I mean, it'll probably come. There'll probably be a few days in his life, at least, where he's mad at you. And you're going to have to go and talk with him. And try to repair that relationship. And it'll be up to him whether he re receives that and accepts that and all that. But you've got to go. In marriages, with children, with parents, with brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is important. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask in Jesus' name that you will take the word of God today and all the songs and all the great truths that were presented and use them in our hearts Father, I pray that you'll bind our families together in Christ. Father, that you'll put a burden on our hearts about relationships, that wherever our marriage is, we'd want it to grow stronger and stronger. Wherever our relationship is with our mom or dad or with our children, we'd want it to grow stronger and stronger. Wherever our relationship with, is with fellow church members, we'd want it to grow stronger and stronger. And Father, I just pray that you will bless the preaching of the word of God today and use it for your honor and for your glory. We pray that you'll do great work in the families of this church, Lord, and around the world, really, as this message goes around the world, even now. We just ask that you would be honored and that you would be glorified, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.